You don't know the awesomeness of a puppy's paw pets? I guess not. But yeah, I bet they would feel nice. Right? Half Glass Gaming. What is it? You know what it is. Welcome back. We're all huddled around the mic and we're going to start talking. Across from me, I have Josh. Just Josh. To his left, he has Mandy. Hi. Across from her is the Rev. I don't remember why we call this Half Glass Gaming. All you need to know is that I came up with the title and so therefore it sticks. I'm sure that made sense to me when I agreed to do it, but now it does not. Mm. Across from Josh to Mandy's left and the Rev's right is me, Julian Watkins. My middle name is Lucas. I was named after the character Luke from General Hospital. Not the the main character from Mother 3? No. That would have been so much cooler. I mean, how old do you think Juliet is? Yeah, right? I'm flattered, I think. (laughs) It's a very deep voice for a 10-year-old. Well, (laughs) hey, I smoke a lot of cigarettes, okay? (laughs) And I like my coffee dark roasted because I don't like a lot of caffeine. How you guys doing? How's it hanging? Uh, I'm still playing Shovel Knight. Quick pass. Mandy, what's up with you? Um, Saturday we went to, uh, Comic Book College, our local comic shop. Ah, because, yes. uh, Sam Humphreys, who writes Star-Lord, was going to be there signing stuff. So Jess is like, do you want to go? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And so we go and we get there and there are, like, a bunch of people crowded around and I won't even walk near. I'm just, I get so much anxiety. But it's stuff like that, I always say I want to go, and when I get there, I just, I can't exert myself enough to go up mm-hmm. and, like, ask a person to sign something for me. So we just bought regular comics and left, and I was feeling kind of bad about my social skills, and then we went to get a Vita for my birthday, and the guy at GameStop was so nervous the <laughs> whole time. Like, was he a fandy? I, I, I don't know, maybe... I I presume he was a fandy. Mm -hmm. I think he was confused by the fact that he was helping a female buy a PlayStation Vita, and it was clearly for her and not for me. His whole life was flipped upside down, and Mm -hmm. he was like, did not know how to act in this situation. I felt so bad because he was like trying to recommend me games. He's like, well, have you ever heard of a game called Persona 4? And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I I have, it's one of my favorite games, but I haven't played Goldman. He'd like look so sad every time I already knew what he was talking about. And then he had to ask me for my phone number because I didn't have my GameStop card. And like, he didn't want to. (laughs) He was so nervous the whole time. And I'm like, this is how other people must feel all the time i i presume like, that he thought you people. were really hot i don't know <laughs> that's my he, was, he, he had but it, it was a situation in which i had the superior social skills and that doesn't happen for me very often that's awesome and like my social skills are so far above this guy's and it, it made me feel a lot better about not getting starlord comics signed by sam humphreys wow that reminds me actually once when i was in uh, madison Going to my local comic shop years ago, Neil Gaiman was there signing stuff. And uh, my brother was like, who's that over there? And this guy was like, it's Neil Gaiman. And we were like, oh, uh, can we get through the line so we can go to the checkout, please? <laughs> so how are you doing, Julian? Well, you know, I, I ran into the author uh, P.H. Finkelstein and uh, <laughs> got into a rousing conversation with him about Apple Snapples. And... <laughs> no, you know what? I've been doing a little Metal Gear here and there when I can. Saving sheep and uh, Fultoning guys out by the their trousers and i uh managed to procure a couple of uh decks of gwent can't wait to get my hands on those puppies i'm actually excited about that because it means i can sit down with just josh here and julian and do some real gaming i think it's actually going to be a good opportunity for my lady friend and i to play some gwent she doesn't really like video games that much outside of two-player mario themed games but uh with cats yeah but you know she likes board games and things like that and gwent kind of seems like something that's easy to wrap your head around but also get like super competitive over and uh, that's because real gaming is great how about you josh i i'm a little tired today i i was really tired last night and i went to bed early and then there's a bunch of people having really bizarre conversations outside of my bedroom window (laughs) and (laughs) Like, bizarre, like, these, so I'm lying there in bed and I hear this, these guys talking about pee. Like, <laughs> like one's, one guy's like, oh, I'm going to pee on your pee. And then the other guy's like, oh, we're like a couple of dogs marking our territory. And so, I, you know, I like 
kind of peeked my head out the window and expected to see a couple of frat dudes, but it's like two du- business dudes, like <laughs> dressed in like ties and everything. And <laughs> after th- after this, they like proceeded to just talk about business and like, <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the yeah, we can increase market share by five percent if we blah blah. And it was like, yeah. what is going on? Yeah. And so I was I was like tired but also fascinated by this thing that i had just witnessed and like a half hour later there was a bunch of people like fighting outside of my window Mm -hmm. because it was just a late night thing that happens in you know close enough to downtown minneapolis that's why i like living where i live in the link to comas area it Mm. is just in a nice enough area that everybody feels like they're in a fancy area but it's right under the uh flight path of a lot of airplanes because it's so near the airport Mm -hmm. that it's cheap enough that i can live there Mm. it's great so i'm I'm like close to downtown and close to uptown so there's a lot of you know post bar stuff that i can yeah from either direction when I have my windows open, but I'm not gonna lie, well, like, I kind of wish I was around here more often, just because post bar stuff is the greatest shit to get stoned and just get involved in. <laughs> it rem- it actually reminded me of the Phantom Pain when you're walking around on the base and you of, just, of course it reminded you of Metal Gear Solid, right? And it because you you overhear just the most bizarre conversations and Puppy like pads. there's there's one conversation I heard in Metal Gear where people were talking about touching because you get you can get a puppy in the game and then people are like talking about how they want to touch the puppy's paw pads like oh, i wonder what it'd feel like to rub the puppy's paw pads wow the line is you don't know the awesomeness of a puppy's paw pads <laughs> <laughs> he just had it's too good no that's that's a good line that's hilarious yeah and there's another conversation about these two guys arguing whether the dog is a wolf or a dog of course it's a dog <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> Yeah, I think that's one of the nicer things about current gaming is that they can sort of include these miscellaneous kind of um, side conversations that just you can walk into and hear. And I remember the first time I experienced these the entertaining back and forth conversations was actually Final Fantasy X, uh, which, you know, you get into <laughs> battle and in battle, the characters would just say stuff. For a while, I thought that they just said, you know, like individual pre-planned lines uh, and didn't actually converse with each other. But so they go into battle and Yuna says in a faux Waka voice, lots of enemies here, yeah? And Lulu responds, don't do that. (laughs) It was just the most hilarious thing to me. Like Oblivion had a lot of just bizarre stuff. Like, oh, I hear Mary's taken to jumping off buildings. It's like, what? Uh, There's uh, in Skyrim, in um, the Dragonborn DLC, when you go to Solstheim, uh, you will find this mage who's talking about, I focus my power or something. And he winds up trying to fly by shooting some energy at the ground and like fleeing himself high up in the air and then he dies when he lands because he can't actually fly uh, it was kind of hilarious well i think at this point it's uh become obvious that the conversations are really starting to heat up so i think it's a good time to uh call a break uh, going into the break of course i'd like to thank uh snapple um <laughs> look they're not paying me okay and I don't even drink the shit, but Josh Josh seems enamored by it, and he's an all right Joe, so... It's A-OK. You know what I mean? It floats his boat, whatevs, right? But I will like to thank 2XAA, Wheelie, I don't know you, but I'd like to think that in a perfect world, we could sit down and enjoy a nice grilled cheese sandwich. We wouldn't even have to say anything. We would just know. We're on the same page, okay? I'd like to thank uh, Retroevolve.com as well. We're also on iTunes. I think the lights are still on at geekparty.com. You might need to knock a little loud, though. (laughs) Um, And when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about sound design in games. We'll be back. Welcome back, and I think it's time to cut the shit and really get down to brass tacks here. Sound design. Uh, Let's kick it off. You know, what's the deal with sound? What are we talking here? When we talk sound design, 
how much does the actual music, as opposed to, like, the sound effects... You know, if if I'm talking sound design and I start humming do 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 do, is that part of sound design or is it not? So sound design would encompass everything, like everything you hear in a game, from the sound effects to the voice acting to the music. And the overall sound design is basically what should your game sound like? People, they don't, especially reviewers, I will say. It just seems like some people don't quite understand the value of sound design in games. I worked as an editor in in games journalism for a while, and you know, obviously, I've read a lot of reviews, and it feels like a vast majority of people writing game reviews don't really understand how to talk about sound. Sound is a huge part of what makes or breaks a video game. No, and I agree. I mean, like, what would a game like Thomas Was Alone be without its fantastic sound design? Well, like one of the one of the things I've seen a lot is just people say, "Oh, the game sounded fine," and they don't know how to talk about that. And I mean, there are technical terms, there are concepts that make sound work in a game better than working in a different game. I think part of the reason uh, reviewers don't know how to talk about sound design is that it's one of those things where if it's done right, then you almost don't notice it specifically. All you notice is it being good. Mm -hmm. But if it's done wrong, that's when you really notice it. So, you know, most people don't know how to talk about it Mm because they don't know how to say this is done right. The problem really is that the people who write about video games come from a journalism background or they come from a film studies background, which is which is really common. They don't typically come from an audio production background. And it's like if you're into film, if you're into journalism, if you're into writing, if you're into video games, the like audio production isn't the obvious thing to study. But sound is in general not treated very well. Like the um the Tonys. Uh they recently decided that sound tech was not an award worthy uh segment. So they did away with their their sound award, which is bullshit. Like, you know, I I know enough uh of theater to know that doing sound is a really uh spe- like specific and intricate skill, but for some reason people who don't do it don't realize that. And I mean it's no one's fault. I don't want to poo-poo on games journalism for this whole episode. Uh, I just think sound isn't really the obvious thing to study. And so there are very few experts who are qualified to talk about it who aren't actually sound designers. But I do want to talk about some of the really cool things that are happening in, in sound design in video games and and whatnot. One thing I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of soon is procedural sound design, where the sounds are procedurally generated for the situation. We've seen a little bit of it in games already. Actually, the bicycle sound effects in GTA V were procedurally generated. But really? It, yeah. And that actually makes things easier for the sound designers in that they don't have to dredge up the specific sample for every single instance. But it's also just really fascinating the idea that two players aren't going to have the same audio experience. Do you want to explain a little bit about what procedurally generated sound is for people that don't know? Procedural sound is when the game's engine is able to synthesize brand new sounds based on the data that it has. For example, in Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, it'll look at story sequences and events you've already experienced and then combine those when they need ambient dialogue sounds. In GTA V, they actually built a real-time sound synthesis tool so as you go to do something it'll synthesize a brand new sound effect right then that nobody's heard before one of the things that we even mentioned on an earlier episode of the podcast was no man's sky and it's procedurally generated sounds where a monster cry would be generated based on the shape of its of the the creature's throat which is also procedurally generated yeah exactly like that It was about six months before The Last of Us came out. I had the chance to sit down with uh, Jacob Minkoff, who was the uh, lead creative designer on on The Last of Us. And I was like, let's talk sound, man. And he had this this really fascinating uh, explanation of how they were handling sound in The Last of Us. And he talked about 
how the Naughty Dog team built what he referred to as probably the most complex portal occlusion system ever created for a video game. And that went over my head, but he started explaining it and is like, we've created all of these filters. And so all of the sounds in the game are run through a filter based on where your character is located. And so if your character is in a hallway and there is a, you know, like a clicker on the end of the hallway, his sound effect will go through a filter that makes it sound like it's at the end of the hallway. Um, if that same clicker is on the other side of a wall from you, that same sound will be played, but it will be run through a filter that makes it sound like it's coming through a wall. Uh, when you're playing the game, your brain can locate things based on sound alone. You can say, oh, that clicker is at the end of the hall. That clicker is on the other side of this wall. That's a really, really interesting, fascinating thing. And likewise, uh, oftentimes I just play Skyrim and, you know, whatever. But when I finally had a computer with a decent sound uh, setup and I put in headphones, I suddenly started noticing that when you're in towns and the NPCs are just saying their lines, you can hear, oh, well, that NPC is over that way or that NPC is behind me, which I couldn't. I couldn't hear, I couldn't, like, discern that when I didn't have the headphones in. There have actually been a lot of studies that looked at how people played games with sound versus how people played games without sound. Uh, there was one study where they took players with Doom and had one group play with sound and one play without. The people who were playing with sound had scores twice as high as the people who were playing without but, I mean, the opposite is true, too. Uh, there was another study that had people play Ridge Racer 5 with and without sound, and people actually did significantly better without sound. But if I remember correctly, uh, Ridge Racer 5 actually had really good sound design, but terrible music. Like, the way the car sounded changed based on their proximity to you, but the music was just so annoying, like, I couldn't stand it. So maybe it was just that people did better without the music. The first time I ever noticed sound being important was the resident the first resident evil game mm -hmm. on ps1 That's exactly what i'm thinking of because uh, i need to hear if there's a moaning nearby because otherwise i will get jumped by a zombie and get eaten yeah what's interesting about the first resident evil is that that is in my mind the first time i realized uh, it was uh aware of the difference in the footstep sound effects oh now they're on a marble floor and they transition into a carpet and the sound were different and i was just like whoa that's like real life <laughs> i'm blown away one of my uh, my stepbrother's cousins was blown away by the fact that in mario 64 you can hear his footsteps it's like tick, 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 mm -hmm. all the time he's like holy shit you can hear his footsteps what is this yeah what's game? happening here <laughs> <laughs> and sound design can affect you in a lot of ways that you don't even realize yeah it absolutely can one of the reasons why call of duty multiplayer is so addictive is because they're giving you streamlined feedback in real time for everything that you're doing. And so when you shoot an enemy and it hits its mark, there's a, an X on your, on your crosshair showing you visually that you hit the mark, but there's also a very specific sound that you get. And it's like a mm -hmm. sound. And when you hear that sound and see that X, you know hey, I shot my gun and I hit exactly what I was aiming at. Mm -hmm. I hit someone with my gun. And so I wouldn't say that's necessarily like an iconic sound, mm -hmm. but that sound is very deliberately put in, into that game to let players know that they hit the target. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of the game experience and that's part of understanding that, hey, for some reason... When I play Call of Duty and I shoot someone, it feels better mm -hmm. than when I'm playing, uh, you know, Payday, mm -hmm. and I shoot someone and there's there's no feedback telling me whether I hit mm -hmm. or missed until I see like see the guy drop in the distance. You know, a lot. I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand why it w is more satisfying in one game than the other. The reason is because the sound design is very deliberately designed mm -hmm. to to give player a certain type of feedback and that like that's good design but it goes so unnoticed but i think someone who's trained 
to pick up on those cues is going to notice mm-hmm. it. You know, I mentioned Resident, the first Resident Evil game where I first noticed sound design. Uh, now I'm thinking of shooting the zombies. And maybe this was on purpose, but so you fired your gun and it made a gun firing sound, but there was no real indication of whether or not the zombie was dead. And in fact, sometimes the zombie mm. would drop and it would still be alive. And if you tried to walk past it, it would grab it's your ankle bleeding. or whatever. Right. They bleed out when they're dead. Right. But that, like, that was it. There was no sound to it. There was mm-hmm. no sound of the bullets hitting the zombie. There was no sound of the zombie dying. Uh, it was just the sound of the gunshots and the blood pool if the zombie died. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, that didn't feel like killing zombies was worthwhile other than removing a potential obstacle. Mm. But even something we talked about back in episode five is in the game Submerged, when you're using the telescope, uh, there's a clicking sound when you're zooming in on things. Just the sound that the telescope makes feels satisfying, and it subconsciously makes that telescope more fun to use. Mm -hmm. Thinking back on retro games, obviously there's some iconic music and sound effects that you know we all recognize to this day, but I guess I don't quite understand retro sound design as a whole. Uh, perhaps, Mandy, you could shine some, sli- well, some light on that. Sound designers had to take a completely different approach in the days of retro consoles, particularly with consoles prior to the Super Nintendo and the Genesis. On those early consoles, you couldn't just compose music or create a sound. You basically had to know how to program it. So you had to be a programmer and a composer and a sound designer all at the same time. There are some late NES games that have really strange sounding music, and in some cases that occurred because the people who composed the music for the game didn't actually know how to program, and so they had to use all these tricks in order to make their compositions work on the NES. There's a really bad little game that came out in 1992 called Color a Dinosaur. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Color a Dinosaur? actually came out in 1993, but all you did was color pictures of dinosaurs. Uh, The composer for that game was actually Tommy Tallarico, who did the music for Cool Spot. Which is fantastic. Oh, yeah. Cool Spot has some of the greatest music in the the Genesis era. He's a great composer, but in this case, he was hired on after the release of the Super Nintendo. He'd never made music for an NES game. He uh, had heard about a project called Color a Dinosaur, but nobody had told him what it was. And then one day, his boss steps by his office and tells him that he has one day to compose all the music and create all the sounds for this weird little game. Somebody had created a program that could convert MIDI files to ASC files so that they could be used on the NES. Was that someone from Virgin Games? It was actually the vice president of Virgin Games, Stephen Clark Wilson. Oh, wow. So he created the music... And the music itself probably isn't that bad, but because it was converted and it couldn't be polished at all, it just sounds really distorted and really strange, and it doesn't help that the game is just ridiculously bad. In the retro era, because you were so limited, you basically were creating your sounds on a synthesizer. What people would do a lot of the time was instead of creating a an accurate representation of a sound they would create, like an audio metaphor. Like, obviously, it doesn't go whoop when people jump, but mm-hmm. when Sonic jumps, it does. Mm-hmm. And we all hear that sound and know that it's the sound of Sonic jumping. And it has no basis in reality. It's just a sound, but we've, you know, mentally tied that sound to that action in that game. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's so much fun to think about how they created all these sounds in that era, because the hardware was so limited that it didn't really make sense to go out and you know, record a bunch of sound effects the way they do now, though you could import some sounds into the game. The NES actually had a dedicated channel for those noises, but since it was 8-bit, they were going to sound kind of distorted and electronic. Yeah, they could even do some voice acting in that era. Uh, There was voice acting even in the 8-bit era, a little bit, there, there got to be a lot more of that in the 16-bit era, 
but it, it wasn't anything intense like like Metal Gear Solid's super long cutscenes or anything. It was like you would just have like a kid on a skateboard and he'd go, all right, when you hit start or whatever. Um, Punch you know. out. Right. That's weird because thinking about it that way, how do you determine what jumping on a turtle sounds like? Right. And that's a big part of what sound design is. It's, you know, figuring that stuff out, determining what collecting a ring sounds like in Sonic or what picking up an item sounds like in Metal Gear. These are conscious choices that people had to make. And so that is a great question. I mean, when you sit down and you have a very limited programmable sound chip, uh, how do you use that sound chip to make the sound of, you know, crashing into a cow in Road Rash or kicking a turtle shell in Mario? Mm. The NES's uh, fifth wave channel was entirely dedicated to sample playback, like those weird audio clips. Like, punch out. So the NES hardware had five audio channels. You can think of this in terms of like a modern recording studio where you would record guitar on one channel and vocals on a separate channel and then background vocals on a separate channel and bass guitar on another channel and uh you know you might have four mics to record drums so that you can keep your drum sounds uh, separated in the mix but in a modern recording studio you won't be limited to a really small amount of channels so you can you know, set up all of these mics and set them to different audio channels and then mix them down later. Uh, with the NES hardware, you only had five channels. Two of those were dedicated to like your pulse wave uh, synthesizer. One was a triangle wave synthesizer. The fourth channel would have been a noise channel and it would generate like a kind of staticky noise sound, like a which you could use for like drums and things like that so like you know a really short clip of, a, of the noise channel would be like and make a kind of drum sound but the fifth channel was a channel that you could actually import lo-fi samples a lot of sound designers use that in really interesting ways like super mario brothers 3 has these really cool steel drum percussion sounds <laughs> They actually did that by recording actual steel drum percussion sounds and then using them as a really lo-fi audio sample and then building the rest of the music around that so that they could have that sound even though they didn't really have the ability to just record it and put it straight in the game. And to some extent that still prevails in modern game design. It's like in a science fiction game, you have to determine what these things sound like. You know, you can't just go out and record the sound of an alien. You've, you've got to figure out what you think that would sound like. The Journey sound designer, Steve Johnson, has talked a lot about how he created the effects for that game. And I know it's a very different game from the old Mario titles, but like he really went and thought about how would this sound? How could it possibly sound like the people in mm -hmm. Journey communicate through sort of a sound talk. So he went and used birds since birds sort of communicate through song talking too, mm -hmm. through chirping. So he recorded a bunch of different chirps and he worked with the composer of the game to turn that into different sounds for communication. He looked at like the shape of the characters and they're not, sh their feet aren't shaped like human feet. So he used fingers to record all the walking hmm. sound effects. So w walking on sand, he would have record his fingers walking around a box of sand, walking on rocks. He would record his fingers walking on rocks and then for the cape he used a bomber jacket and he would like shake it out he would pour sand on his bomber jacket in the sandy environments and then shake out his bomber jacket so it would sound like a cape moving through sand mm -hmm. and i mean i think that's really similar to how people create sounds for film too so i think modern sound design has become a lot more cinematic speaking of film it, you know it's attributed to martin scorsese this uh this idea of needle dropping, mm -hmm. you know, where you sort of just drop in a, a song that kind of isn't necessarily juxtaposition of the scene that it's sort of uh, playing over, but just sort of somehow conjures this feeling or creates this sort of, I don't know, this element that it's kind of hard to put your finger on. And I think definitely games have um, uh, started to use pop 
music. Um, Hideo Kojima has been using it for a while now. And uh, Grand Theft Auto with their radio stations sort of allowing the music to sort of dictate the world and create the atmosphere and the emotion, I guess. So, yeah, I mean, shaking out a bomber jacket with sand in it. I mean, it's like, okay, yeah, that's escape, right? (laughs) But that's like when you watch anything about how the most iconic sound effects were created, except for the Wilhelm scream, which is a really generic sound effect. What does that come from? It's from the 1951 film Distant Drums, which nobody has ever even seen, but uh, it's a man being eaten by an alligator. Hmm. Was his name Wilhelm? (laughs) No, no, it's the guy who did the song, the one-eyed purple people eater is the guy screaming in the Wilhelm scream. (laughs) But Ben Burt, who is the sound designer for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, uh, used it in both movies, and then it really caught on, and people started using it in everything. Can we have a quick sample of that? Ah, I don't, I have to. Ah! Ah! <laughs> hold on, hold on, I'm just going to play a sample of it for everyone. It's you know, such a bad sound effect. It really is. It's it's a ridiculous sound effect, and it's it's kind of unbelievable that so many people like, just keep using it. Yeah, just record another fucking scream. I feel like the reason people keep using it at this point is because it's iconic. Yeah. Right. It's. I mean, I I feel like people use it more as like a reference. Mm-hmm. Than, right. Like, oh, here's an inside joke. We got the iconic sounds are a thing. The the Super Mario one up sound. You know, everybody knows what that sounds like. The the Super Mario mushroom. Everyone knows what that sounds like when you grow big or you grow small. I think everybody knows what all of the Mario sound effects yeah, right. sound like at this or point. Or like, so I've got a great story. Um, a few years back, whenever I would do laundry and whenever the laundry was done... The washing machine would beep at me like most washing machines do. And whenever I would hear that the load was done, I would get really tense. Like, you know, I need to do something. I need to fix something. And I couldn't figure out why. And I finally realized the beeping noise that the washing machine made was the exact same beeping noise that happened on Legend of Zelda Link to the Past when you had low health. I had so ingrained the sound from Link to the Past that whenever I heard the beep in some other context, I would still feel like, holy shit, I have to fix this. Mm. I I feel like this is probably an auditory chocolate chip cookie and oatmeal raisin cookie situation. (laughs) It is totally (laughs) not, and fuck you. Where they don't really sound alike, unless it's you. (laughs) No, they totally sounded alike. Well, now, as a, a counterpoint, though, to our discussion... Would you guys say that uh, aiming for realism makes sound effects less iconic? I think it makes them less memorable. Mm -hmm. And it's like I said a a while ago, like Mario, when he jumps, makes a specific sound. Mm -hmm. Sonic, when he jumps, makes a specific sound. They're two completely different sounds. Mm -hmm. And they have nothing to do with reality. Mm -hmm. And so that sticks out in our mind really well. Or like the sound of... Uh, having low health in a Zelda game is mm-hmm. a specific sound. You know, we're getting into an age where people are shooting for realism. And so the sound of realistic footsteps, I don't think, sticks out in your mind mm-hmm. the same way the sound of like really cartoony, exaggerated jumping does. Mm-hmm. Which wraps back around to what I was saying. Uh, when you're trying to go for realism, uh, sound design becomes one of those things that you don't notice until it's done wrong mm-hmm. because it's realistic. You know what the sound of a lead pipe hitting a zombie or hitting something squishy that, you know, like a watermelon or whatever, you kind of know what that sounds like. So when you hear a more realistic sound, it just sounds normal. You don't think about it. When you hear it sounding incorrect, that's when you notice it, as opposed to the retro sounds where it was really iconic because it was a metaphor. There wasn't anything in real life that sounded like that. So you had to kind of like see, okay, does this, does this connect to the metaphor they're trying to make? Yes or no. And then you noticed it. Um, a lot of sound designers take advantage of that. 
uh, that they deliberately make things sound wrong to get a reaction from a player. Uh, Martin Stig Anderson, who did the sound design for Limbo, talked about trying to make everything sound ambiguous or a little off so people would always sort of feel disoriented and just not really feel comfortable uh, knowing what's going on. Like they felt like their footsteps shouldn't sound the way their footsteps sound. So they'd be really uncomfortable with the situation and they wouldn't know why. That's something a lot of horror games do. You'll notice a slight sound change and you won't really know what it means. Mm -hmm. And it creates this sense of unease. It's a really powerful tool that was a lot harder to use in older games because you just couldn't create a new set of sounds for a situation. And now, you know, developers can literally paint soundscapes. When you're getting close to the outskirts of the town, you can have the town blending with the sound of the forest. So you mm -hmm. can hear the forest animals, but you can hear the soft voices of the people of the town. And you couldn't do anything even mm -hmm. approaching on that in an older game. So you can yeah. use sound in more interesting ways. And it's allowed for certain genres like horror games to really thrive in mm -hmm. ways they didn't in the past. Because people don't really pay conscious attention to, to sound the way they pay attention to visuals, um, it's easier to sneak stuff like that in, into a game. Where, whereas, like, if you made a dude's head, like, cr a crazy shape, like, people are going to say, that's off because his head's the wrong mm -hmm. shape. If your audio scape is slightly off, you know, most of your players aren't going to be able to consciously recognize what is off. Mm -hmm. The sound is always a powerful tool, but it's more impactful when the player doesn't realize how the sounds are affecting them. So that's probably why great sound design doesn't get the kind of recognition it deserves. This is the reason why something like Dead Space won so many awards for audio, because it's it's super, super obvious that this is a really well-designed game. Or this, this, the audio in the game was really well-designed. It was, you know, multi-layered. You would stand next to a vent and you would hear things crawling in it. And then you would hear a little kid singing. And it was like, what the fuck is that? And they layered all of these conflicting things that gave you a very strong emotion and a very strong sense of unease but they did the obvious tricks and so when game reviewers looked at it it was like it was obvious that this was a really well-designed game from an audio perspective but something like the last of us which they created a whole system to filter sound people didn't notice it one of my favorite sound design choices uh especially in horror games uh, is the lack of music. Because, like, you don't have this music to kind of guide you and into what you should be thinking. You don't have this music to guide you into whether or not the moment is dangerous. You don't have this music to guide you into whether or not you're in combat or not. All you have is footsteps and maybe some rustling off to the side that could be an enemy or could be some birds or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, like, so I feel like the lack of music is a really important sound design design choice. Mm -hmm. And I would actually say that I think horror has benefited more from improved sound design than any other genre. Yeah. Some people might disagree, but when you look at retro horror, I mean, there are games like Sweet Home that are fantastic, but the genre was never able to thrive until the PlayStation era mm -hmm. when developers could really experiment with sound and mm -hmm. use sound in interesting ways. It was just really holding the genre back prior to that. I think um, uh, Rockstar with the Grand Theft Auto series has taken an advantage of sound um, in ways that I, I've only recently begun to notice and delineate. You know, you're, you're walking down the street. You know, you're hearing the ambient sounds of the traffic, but that guy's radio is muffled because his windows are rolled yeah. up, right? That woman's walking down there. She's got a cell phone going. Or even like the Yakuza titles. The level of uh, authenticity to the ambient street chatter. Because uh, yeah, well, people will, you'll hear like these, and you can't even you really can't tell what they're saying. And there's so many people, so you can be walking around like, that, that sounds like an interesting conversation, but yep. there's so many conversations going on. Yeah. You can't even really pick it up. Like a really cool audio thing that I've, that is more recent is, um, Starting from like the Wii era Mario games, mm -hmm. um, when when you have a water level, when you're swimming above the water, the music sounds normal. But then when you go underwater, mm -hmm. the music's all of a sudden like muffled. Mm -hmm. And so 
it sounds like you're hearing the music that's kind of far off and muffled because you're underwater and then you you pop back up and the music's like normal again uh, speaking of the wii but then carrying over into sort of like the ps4 and the xbox one consoles the addition of the uh on the controller oh, yeah. so now you have the audio coming from your television or your your Set. But then all of a sudden, the phone call is coming through in your hands. Things are just sort of now coming at you from all over the place, and it's it's interesting. Yeah. Have any of you played Shattered Memories on the Wii? No. Uh, your Wiimote is a cell phone. Oh, really? And so your your Wiimote like rings and you answer it, and yeah. that's the one. I don't like the Wiimote like at all. Yeah, it's but that one game. Your remote was a cell phone and a flashlight, and it was perfect. Yeah, that's the one time like I really felt like I appreciated the remote, and it it sounded so cool. It was incredibly immersive, mm-hmm. like to be like answering this phone and like I held it up to my ear, even mm-hmm. though I didn't have to. I was just so caught up in what was happening. Mm, yeah, I think to go back to the question I had posed about sort of losing the iconic nature of sound to realism, it allows you as games sort of uh, become more and more realistic to really immerse yourself into the experience. Uh, So yeah, will we ever have another one-up sound? I don't know. I think a good example of a modern developer who does that really well is Supergiant, who did Bastion and Transistor. Mm -hmm. And I definitely don't think they ever aim for realism in their sound design, but the sound design is a huge Mm -hmm. part of what makes their games appealing. And they definitely really shoot for those iconic sound effects. There was one time Josh was playing Transistor and I was trying to sleep in the other room and like I couldn't sleep because the sound effects are just so overpowering in that game. Like you have to focus Mm -hmm. on them as soon as you hear them. Well, And a comment that I was making as far as immersion is that uh, realistic sound for realistic games. I mean, a war game, you know, you don't want to fire a gun and it's like pew, pew, pew. You don't want to fire a bow and arrow in Skyrim and it's like throwing. (laughs) So yeah, no, I definitely agree that there are times. If you're playing Shovel Knight... You don't want to kill somebody and have it just literally be blood curdling. You know, there's no place for that. Although, to be fair, if in Skyrim I shot a bow and it went, I might use bows more often because that's fucking fantastic. I just think that, you know, because there maybe is more of a focus on realistic audio in realistic games, I think it, that's where you're lending a level of immersion. Small things like even in Journey, you know, yeah, the sand Journey isn't sound isn't a realistic and, game, but I think right. they thought about what would a realistic sound be in a very different universe, and I think that's a really interesting mm-hmm. perspective to mm-hmm. take for sound design. As as a writer, I find that sometimes my favorite thing to do is to come up with the idea of okay, so here's this universe I've set up that is not like the real universe. What would things realistically be like in this not like our universe? Mm -hmm. And the journey does that with sound. And that's, that is a really interesting thing. Well, I think like Fallout 3, the VAT sound. I mean, if anybody's familiar with it, you know what the hell it is. And that's pretty iconic, I think. Uh, The use of sound in Fallout 3 in general is great. Uh, Fallout 3, I mean, not that it doesn't use music, but a lot of times instead of using music, they just create soundscapes Mm -hmm. where it's just sort of, a bunch of ambient noise. Mm-hmm. It's like you fits. wandered into an episode of House. <laughs> There's a, an, a there's such a range in the Fallout games between more realistic sounds and then really weird sounds because they have that weird, campy, retro aesthetic mm-hmm. that's a part of the Fallout series. And the blending of that, too, mm-hmm. could be and, and the, a really unique and interesting experience. The radio is such a huge part of Fallout 3. Like, mm-hmm. how oh, yeah. people interact with the radio and how they listen to it uh, and how it that affects their gameplay, which, yep. you know, it, there's sound design for you how these songs affect what they're doing i think the character's name was agatha the violin player in fallout 3 you could find her a uh, stratocaster stratocaster various stratovarius stratovarius look it's a violin okay (laughs) bring it to her and all of a sudden now you have a third um music channel that's just her playing. I think there's only like five or six songs, but it was probably my favorite part. Daredevil says holding Captain America's shield is like holding a Stradivarius. Really? Really. <laughs> <laughs>
even in super hyper realistic games, I think there still is room for those type of metaphoric sounds. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like Call of Duty with that thump. Like mm-hmm. your character wouldn't actually hear the bullet going into the body from you know a hundred yards away, but mm-hmm. you can you can still hear it just as loud as it's it's your body. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you're talking about like menu sounds and mm-hmm. and things like that, there's there's definitely room for like really creative and really iconic sound design and i think the more recent metal gear solid games really do walk the line between really iconic sound metaphors and real real realistic sound effects Mm -hmm. whereas like a helicopter sounds like a helicopter but when you pull out your goggles and you're looking around there's this like synth sound when you like spot a person it's like or the sound effect of when you pick up an item that Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and menu is actually a really great place for iconic sounds, especially was, opening menus. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. I was um, so I was in this forum that was dedicated to Final Fantasy VI, and somebody had not been around for a while, and they you know showed back up, and their post title was "boop boop summon boop boop Chuck," with Chuck was their their forum name, and I like you knew immediately what they were doing. You know, the boop boop was like the sound of moving the arrow to the the summon part. And then, like, the, that's what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. Whoop, whoop. So, yeah, like, the Final Fantasy games have very iconic menu sounds. So, like, mm-hmm. when you're scrolling through a menu and picking different different items in the menu, there's that specific sound that it makes. And that's it's very Final Fantasy, and it's instantly recognizable. Mm-hmm. I'm a little ashamed to admit this, but back in the day when I was really probably playing Final Fantasy games the most, I used to play them with the sound off all the time. It's because I, w- I wouldn't want to stop playing, so I'd turn the TV off and go to bed and then turn the TV back on and mute the game and play it I've been and silent. It. Yeah, we've all been and, but, but the, and then like going back, it's like, oh my gosh, this is the first time I've even seen this important scene with sound and like it's almost depressing that the first time <laughs> yes. I experienced it, it was totally silent because sound is so important to Final Fantasy. So I, it's it, a little bit of a bummer. I, I gave myself my own punishment for skirting bedtime. Well, there's so many small details of especially the retro games but even these days like if you don't hear the sounds you don't feel the full experience but you almost never realize that until it's brought up specifically or until it's done poorly Mm -hmm. and that's why sound design doesn't get as much attention as it really deserves so sound is one of those things that at times can go unnoticed if done really well and can really create tension and and atmosphere and emotions that you aren't even aware that are being stirred up within you, but they're there, man. You know, look, nobody likes the Wilhelm scream. Okay. (laughs) If I hear that thing one more time, you're going to get my Wilhelm foot up your Wilhelm ass. Have a good night, folks.